After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Aenon near Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves hear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. start I think if that's okay I think um, talking about so uh, the scripture reading so this is a section with John the Baptist in it and and um, people are really interested scholars are very interested in John the Baptist and if you ever maybe google it or YouTube it you might get some neat videos about him he's a he's a pretty crazy figure and you know he's wearing he's wearing camel's hair, so that's that's basically camel skin, but turned inside out, so the hair is inside, which is terrible and itchy out in the desert. And he's a an ascetic, you know. He's just eating. They say locust, but that means like a kind of grain, and wild honey. And so he's he's just this crazy wild man, out in the desert, wearing clothes that are super uncomfortable. And, and he's, he feels like his calling, he's been told, is to prepare the way for Jesus, who he does not know who he is. They think he knew Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus was him. So he's just been told, prepare everyone for Jesus to come. So he's out in the, ba- he's out in the desert baptizing people for, for repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. And, and he's powerful. And Jesus says, among those born of women, the most powerful man who's ever lived. That's what Jesus says of him. So he's a, and I wanted to say this, and he doesn't work miracles. And I think that's important because God's power manifests a lot of different ways. And, you know, someone could be working miracles, that's fine. Someone could be very mystical, that's fine. Here's John. We, we don't hear of any visions that he's had. We don't hear of any mystical experiences that he's had. But but here's Here's John the Baptist, exceedingly powerful, and he has a huge, massive following. Even though 
He knows he's only there to prepare the way for Jesus. He's got a massive following, and it's 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 well, it's a lot bigger than Jesus is for quite some time, actually. And there's even dispute. I think what's important to know about John the Baptist is that he, at any moment, he could have, through his ego, gotten attached to his role, and all, and his disciples would have followed him instead of Jesus. If he had just had enough ego to say, no, I don't want to let go of this power I've got. I don't want to let go of this role I have. I'm not done. You know, I'm, I'm interested in it. I like being this person. If he had done that, his disciples would have easily chosen, many of his disciples would have chosen him over Jesus. But he goes out willingly. And, and his disciples come and say, you know, you're, he's baptizing more than you and everyone's going to him. And, and he says, you know, this is the way it's meant to be. He must increase and I must decrease. And I know everyone in here loves that line because it's just, you could say it all day, every day. It could be your whole way in. You know, he must increase and I must decrease. And and I was thinking about, uh, you know, everyone's so concerned with self-esteem and, and there, there are scholarly movements now saying that the entire self-esteem project was an utter failure. It just destroyed people. That It wasn't the way. And, um, and then I, I hope I have this right. I was thinking of Michelangelo, you know, who did these gorgeous sculptures. And they said, how did you do it? And he said, I just cut away everything that wasn't the sculpture. <laughs> and, uh, and you know how in here we're, we're so into apophaticism, um, undefining God, undefining the way even. You know, it, um, I walk around all day. Here's what I don't do. I really don't do this. I don't walk around knowing what I'm doing on this path. I don't. I, I'm walking around the, the, I don't really go anywhere anymore because I work here, but I walk around this little property and I do not know the way. And I don't think that I do. I have a deep trust. I mean, I feel deeply trustful, and comforted. And, and I think even a, a, a deep inner knowing that I'm being led right where I need to be led. I, I know that. But I don't know the way and I don't walk around thinking I know the way. And I will. And I think meditation helps with that because all your good ideas get erased. You know, you just you're, you're on some great trend. You hit deep meditation and you come out and that trend is over. And if it's really from God, it'll come back. But it just it cuts a lot of stuff out. And, you know, you walk around and you're not thinking that much. You know, you're walking around and you're not you don't have a lot of thoughts in your head. And you're not a conglomeration of personality traits and accomplishments and attributes that you've become so proud of. And, but more than that, you know, we come to God by way of apophaticism. The entire journey is, is unlearning and letting go of what we think we know so that what is can happen. So what really is can happen. And anytime you start adding a bunch of ideas to something, you're, um, you're, you're narrating it. You're creating a story in your mind and God isn't part of that story. <laughs> God isn't helping create it. So you're making up a fiction, a fantasy about what your life is, right? So, okay. So, and we know that's true with God and we know that we know God is love, but until you've touched love, you don't know what love is. And after you've touched love, you're in more danger of thinking you know everything about love, right? We just, we know we don't know. And that that ground of not knowing is the best way to receive God's power. It's a permanent openness. It, it's like it, the more I know, think of a satellite dish, the more I know, the narrower that dish is. Until it's so narrow, I could receive nothing. The less I know, the wider it gets. And it just receives more of those uncreated energies that God is shining on us all the time. So, so, so I, I must decrease, he must increase. I think that's the way you get to know yourself. It, it's not so much by defining yourself as it is by letting God remove this, this fear, you know, this 
my friend Tim was a hypochondriac and my good friend in, uh, in California and he comes and visits once in a while. And, you know, I mean, the first 10 years, this guy, he, he always had, you know, a fear of a disease he had <laughs> all the time. And he'd get a little symptom and he'd nurse that symptom and it would become a big thing. And he'd uh, sometimes end up in the, you know, the, the doctor's office getting it checked and, you know, he's riddled with fear. Riddled with nervous angst and fear. But that slowly gets chipped away. That gets removed. And then who he really is shines forth. It's not being proclaimed. It's not being defined. But it, it shines forth better because what he isn't is being removed. So I think of self-discovery in the same way. This is the way of self-discovery. What are you? Let's see what's left when God's done removing everything. You're not. You, you don't even have to figure it out. You know, uh, I feel like I know who I am now, but, but, but it's not an idea. It's not an idea. It's a state of being that is more clear than it used to be. It's a state of being that is more clear than it used to be. It feels a certain way to be me, and I feel more of that now because there's less of what it isn't to listen to. And it's not an idea. It, how, how if, if, if you're a reflection of God, if you're God's child, if you are one of God's ideas, and if you're made in the image of God, you're not going to define that with an identity. You're just not. It's more beautiful than that and more mysterious than that. So I, so, so, and so John says, I, you know, I must decrease and he must increase. And, and, and that means a lot to John because he goes off to get his head cut off for calling out, now I'm not remembering who, in public, a king in public for marrying his brother's wife, which is unlawful to do. And so he gets his head cut off. And that's his end. That's his end. From great power to, well, to heaven. A quick quick road to heaven you know i mean i would say it's pretty instant you watch your head roll down when you're getting sucked up into heaven there's angels singing man you know and and so you got this john figure who who jesus says is filled with power as people seem to see it no miracles no miracles just this character that has given himself to god in a powerful way in a deep and profound way. And that's what you guys are doing. That's what you're doing. And, and I know it looks like, um, sometimes it looks like such a hurdle to get over all the issues that you don't yet want to give to God. And um, I want to tell you there's great joy when you don't have resistance. And so, and I know you do, because um, you're human beings, but... Uh, the less resistance you have, the more you can get up in the morning and say, man, anything you want, your will. I do not want my will. There is a tremendous amount of joy in that. And, and it starts with kicking rocks like, yeah, anything you want. <laughs> That's like the beginning of, you know, it getting good. You're kicking rocks, you know. <laughs> And there's a whole bunch of stages before that where you're like, no, not anything you anything you want except this. But man, if there if there's if there's anything in your life you're holding on to that you're saying, I just I can't give that over to God. Therein lies most of your suffering. Tragically, you probably don't have to give it up. <laughs> and you'll never know until you do say here it is, because you'll you'll never find out. Like you're just scared to find out. Because what if they take this or this? And, you know, mostly God doesn't take stuff. Mostly God, at the, the, at the very worst, God changes your state of being that you want different things. Mostly, that's it. It's just an interchange. That's it. That's all it is. So, so, so John, this powerful figure who doesn't work miracles, who Jesus says is greater than anyone born of human beings 
filled with power because his surrender to God was great. And I guess I'm in a way trying to like encourage and say, hey, just if you're leaning on the edge of something, just give it up. Give it up. Don't the devil's in there saying He'll, God will take it away. You don't even know that. You don't know that. And one thing I'm not going to say what it is just now, but one thing I had to give up from my marriage to work was given back in droves. The thing I was hung up on that I had to give up, then I gave it up, and then in five or six years that thing I gave up had flowered into something beyond anything I'd ever known in my life. It, you don't know. But I did have to give it up because it was before God. It was one of those things where it was like, yeah, stay a little away of this. I'll keep this. So you just never know. And there's an excitement and a joy in freedom. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm attached and encumbered to nothing. I want only the light. I want only the truth. I want it's simple. It makes everything so simple. Then John has these things to say about Jesus, and they're so profound and so powerful and so beautiful. Um, and I wanted to just point out just one angle of it, not anything. You could say a lot about it, but listen to what John says. He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. I mean, that is one among many scriptures that wrecks any notion that Jesus is just a man who became enlightened. Here's this towering figure in John the Baptist filled with power saying, Jesus, he comes from above and he's above all. And he's saying, I am of the earth and I speak of the earth. The one from heaven, he has all the power. And that's just John's way. He's just of directly telling you what this is. Who is your savior? Who is the one healing you? It's not a man who reached enlightenment. It's not a guru. Not a prophet. Savior. There's just so much power in, in this. There's so much power in him. And the, and the scriptures are shot through with this if you pay attention. With this distinction between humans and and Jesus. And we know he was fully human, but we also know he was fully God. The last thing I want to read, and then I want to tell you something else. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And I wanted just to focus on um, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And how beautiful that is. And then uh, I was staying up at the mon I used to stay up at the monastery a lot. And uh, occasionally you'd go up there, there'd be a group of priests on retreat, and then you'd get to kind of hang out with them. Um, and or a group of men uh, staying. And in this case, it was a group of men staying. I don't remember where from, but there was kind of a wild man up there. There was this guy that was really on fire and loud and, you know, um, 
you go to the monastery, everyone's quiet. And this guy's loud, man. He's so loud. And, but the monks liked him anyway because he just, he was really exuberant about things. And it was way, I think it was the first time I was exposed to this idea, which I've shared a million times in here, that that the equivalent, because I, I was from the New Age. At that time, I was barely out of it. And he said, all religions are under the Mosaic law, except Christianity. And I, and I thought, well, what? No, Buddhism is not. He said, sure, it's karma. It's karma. Mosaic law is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What goes out comes back to you. He said, that's the same as karma. He said, anywhere you look in the world, you will find everyone is under Mosaic law. But Jesus is the way outside of the law. Jesus is the way outside of karma. Jesus is, is the gate that allows you to transcend this massive gap where you're locked down in this mechanistic world where everything bad you ever do is visited back upon you. Where the wrath of God is upon you. I mean, it, I take that as a figure of speech, frankly. But, it, it, you know, if I were debating someone very intelligent and I said, no, 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 there's no wrath of God, man. It's just the way things are. Then someone would say, yeah, but why are they that way? <laughs> Who made them that way, right? So what is the wrath of God then? It's the natural consequence of a universe without grace, without access to infinite forgiveness, infinite love, and his authority. So it's, it's like I celebrated it. When I was in the New Age, I loved karma. We always told, spoke of karma. It was something we spoke of all the time. You know, and, and clearly, well, we had really good karma because <laughs> we were so advanced. <laughs> Our gifts proved we'd done great things in past lives, you know, whatever, all that crazy stuff. Um, okay, so then, okay, that's all I want to say about him. But now I want to just say a short little thing about this baptism thing that's happening. And um, I didn't expect it to be so beautiful. I didn't know. I've been ducking requests to baptize people for, well, Raya's right, been here a long time. I, I remembered we had done it. People have asked me. And Chase asked me recently. And for some reason, I thought we better do it. I don't know what happened, but it changed. And it has been gorgeous. Um. I can't explain, Jill, to you, you know, noticing. And um, I feel such a wonderful, it feels like living water. It just feels like living water pouring down. Um, I ducked it for years because I'm really, really strongly apophatic. So I started a Bible study and that's all it meant. Seven or six people sitting around studying the Bible. That's it. I don't know what this means. I don't know what this is. I don't know what it's going to be. And it just slowly grew. And at some point, people started wanting to be baptized, and, and I wouldn't do it for lots of reasons, one of which, I'm just going to be honest, I'm just uncomfortable performing any ritual. Um, I found Paul. Paul said, Paul said he almost baptized almost no people. And he had his, his friends do it. And he said, I wasn't sent to baptize, I was sent to preach the gospel. And I feel a lot like that. I, I really do. People ask me to marry them, and I just get, I want to throw up. <laughs> I've done it a couple times, but man, I'm just so uncomfortable. And I, and, you know, and I get home, and I'm so tired. I'm like, oh, that was so hard. And it's just not my thing, you know. Um, but, but anyway, we, I found a way for that to work. And Chase asked, and I, and I said yes. And there's just been... Um, just a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful energy pouring down to do it. And, uh, and, and, you know, I asked Daniel, you know, and he said he wants to, and his wife wants to, his kids want to. And he said he's often been uncomfortable that he's not, I hope it's okay I say this, often been uncomfortable that he's not baptized, but he didn't want to go to a church, have them do it, and then never attend. 
and it just at this point it seems painfully obvious like yes i'm so apophatic but also slow <laughs> because it just seems so painfully obvious that that is un not something you want to do you don't want to send people over to get baptized there and have them never go to church there so we'll just do it it's no big deal we're not starting a new religion any baptized Christian, even in the Catholic tradition, can baptize anybody into Christianity. The priest does it, it's customary, but anyone can do it. So, you know, we're just going to go ahead and do that. And and I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I just, I guess I would have never said yes if this wonderful, beautiful energy hadn't poured in. I think it's going to be neat. Um, in the In the scriptures... Some people will receive the Holy Spirit and then later get baptized. There's, a, there's an interesting thing about the order. not It just isn't practical for it always to work out. They're hearing the message and then boom, they're nailed. And, or they, someone puts their hands on them and bam, they feel the power and that's it. They have the Holy Spirit and then later they get baptized. We're just doing that at a snail's pace. <laughs> you know, 10 years later or so, for some of you, more for some. It's kind of embarrassing. But... But then how neat is this? Um, I think one thing that's really neat about the way we're doing it is that baptism, the ritual of baptism, forgives all of your sins prior to being baptized. It's an automatic, absolute, clean slate wipe. Think of that. I know. I want everyone to think about that. Like, you've been on this path a while, you kind of regret how you've been, you've been a pain in the butt, or, you know, you dragged your feet, or you sloth is in the way, or fear, and whatever, you know. Think of that. Um, we're going to do this ritual, and it's a 100% absolute clean slate. Complete clean slate. And possibly, from what I'm feeling, a chance to receive new life because I am feeling that. And it does seem perfect that we're doing it when the official stage of the center is no longer the night. Because there is a lot of new life coming in. And so I just, I guess, you know, it's just a ritual, you know. It's, it's, it, it's debated in Protestant circles if it's even necessary. I mean, you could argue Jesus said it is. I'm going to read some things he said. If you're not born of water and spirit, you won't enter heaven. I, you're all entering heaven. Um, but, but he did it. The thing is, did he need to be baptized? By John? Right at the start of his public ministry? I can't see any way spiritually where he needed to be. And yet he humbled himself to do it. So then that means there's something sacred in it. Um, you're, you, if you've been baptized before, you're not supposed to get baptized again, but actually I read it's okay. It just It's just that they say you are baptized if you've been baptized, and that's it. There's no one doing it. And I was baptized twice, one, once as a kid at a church camp, and then... Um, well, that wasn't really a baptism. I guess I just got touched by I received the Holy Spirit in seventh grade at a church camp, and it was strong. And then I just started making out with girls and never thought of it again. <laughs> I mean, that's what me and my friend were there for. We were getting girls. But I went up, and I gave my life to Jesus. <laughs> Power came over me, and I never thought about it again. And then, I, and then I got baptized at like 19 at a church. So I received the Holy Spirit many years before I was baptized. So I think that's what you guys will do. And um, I wanted to say, too, if, you're, if you've been baptized LDS, um, I wanted to say this in the right way. There, there just isn't, there are no Christian traditions that recognize LDS baptism. And they're not being mean. They're not being mean. I, I don't think it's mean-spirited at all. I really, it may be with some people, but it's, it's not. Um, there is, the sal salvation is radically different in those two traditions. God is radically different. Jesus is radically different. It isn't the same thing. So if you've been baptized LDS and you feel like you want to, we're going to do it all in one day right in here. Um, 
we bought uh, Jill bought a beautiful baptismal bowl to hold the water and a wooden jug to refill it if we, I want to get river water from the mountains to do it with and we'll all do it as a community and then we're going to have wine and cheese and fruit and juice outside after as a group um, so I think it's going to be I, I think it feels wonderful um, and I, but I want you guys to think of clean slate for you born again Baptism is dying with Christ and being resurrected with Christ. And so if you take it seriously in the way that this community can, and you come to it in a sacred space, then it will be a sacred thing that happens. And I feel the power of that. Um, I'm going to be right there, but Jill's doing the baptisms. I'm going to be right next to her. I'm, not, I'm, I'm right there holding space. But then I won't throw up. <laughs> <laughs> or be so tired at the end of the day. And also, um, you know, we're going to grow the center um, for real. That's not something, I, it's not a whim that's passing. That's something that's going to happen now. I want to grow it slowly. I don't want quality, not quantity. Never lose sight of what it's really about. Never lose sight of anybody who comes. You know what I mean? Everyone remains special and sacred. Uh, what we're doing can't be done with tons of people. Because it takes so long. It's labor intensive. But we're going to grow the center. And um, eventually probably not be in this building. Probably. I would say. I would guess. Eventually. Uh and um, and Jill will be the assistant pastor. That's that is her role. Uh, she's been that forever, but it that'll be her role. That's what will happen. And I have ideas for many of you. <laughs> Just get ready. <laughs> um, okay, listen to this. But we're not starting a new religion. There's no new religion. What is this religion called? Well, it's not a religion and we don't define it. It'll just bug people. <laughs> just tell us exactly what you believe. A little I will. But a proclamation of faith? No, we're not starting a new religion. We don't need more new religions. We just need Christianity practiced deeply. That's what we need. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away calling on his name. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him from the dead. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him.
Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. 